good. Okay, I'm now recording. Should I start? <laughs> okay, well, let me introduce first of all the third <laughs> workshop in our series, and this is broadcasting all the way from Mannheim. Uh, Dan, Dan, it's all yours. Take it away. You have uh, 50 minutes. Uh, tell us whether we should interrupt or how you would like to proceed on that uh, Interrupt as questions come. I am looking forward to many questions and expect many. Okay, so I'm going to start then. Today I'll be presenting Ordered Search, Equilibrium, and Optimum. This is joint with Simon and Maxim, who are also in the audience. So I'm going to do kind of a, a very, very brief overview of what we do, then a less brief one, and then I'm going to go into the model itself. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of these results that we already established with something like discrete choice pricing, and we're going to show that they hold with search in search markets. So we're going to consider an ordered search model, and we're going to show that, for example, intuition that you could develop with Logit is going to hold for some search models. We're then going to show some new insights. Some of these insights are going to be related specifically to pricing, especially hidden prices meaning prices that are only discovered after paying the relevant search cost. But we're also going to characterize search behavior, both with advertised and hidden prices. So we're going to go a bit further on that dimension. Then we're going to demonstrate the robustness of our model and our results, though most of that will not be in the presentation today due to time. Now, underpinning all of this is the conjugate search model, which we're going to argue is a methodological contribution and will underpin all of our results. So before I get into the formal search model, I actually want to talk about this paper by Quint in 2014. So what Quint does is he comes up with sufficient conditions to solve a discrete choice model. Now, Quint considers more or a different setup than what we have today, but the results are going to be helpful for solving pricing games. And what Quint does is he gives sufficient conditions to get existence and uniqueness of a pricing equilibrium. We'll have single product firms picking prices simultaneously. He gives comparative statics relating equilibrium outcomes like markups and mean value to quality and unit costs. And then you, from Quint, but not in Quint, you can get these indexing results where you make it so that firms are symmetric except in their quality or their unit cost. And then you rank them based on their net quality, which is the difference. And the key is that three will follow from Quint, but isn't in Quint. And one through three is really just generalizing intuition that you might have had already from something like multinomial logic, right? These aren't necessarily new results, but what we're gonna show in our paper, which is why I don't mention anything about search here, we're gonna show that this holds with both hidden and advertised prices. And we're gonna do this with a fairly robust model. Okay. The next thing though, is that because this is a search paper, we wanna say things about search, particularly equilibrium search behavior. So if firms are differentiated only on net quality, it's going to make it a bit easier to have this conversation. Relative to socially optimal pricing, you're going to find that firms with an advantage are going to price away some of their advantage with higher markups. And what that's going to mean is that you're going to get a compression in the search order distribution, meaning firms that are higher in the end or that have higher net quality are more likely to appear earlier, but because they're pricing away some of their advantage, there's higher probabilities of flipping in this order. Um, this would be churn if you want to think about it that way. And in a sufficiently covered market, this compression is going to lead to more search. However, if you allow or if you make firms symmetric and uncovered, there's no compression, only positive markups. And so there's less search. And the point here is that if you had an uncovered market with firm asymmetries, it's unclear which of these is going to dominate. So, so am, am I supposed to know what search order means by now? No, and this is one of the key things, which is we'll talk about it once I outline kind of Weitzman scoring and go through all of that. For now, just think the consumer has a set of products that they'll look at and will be flexible in the order that that search can occur in. But the consumer is choosing the order. Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Yes, yeah. Very importantly, the consumer is choosing the order. Um, good question. Yeah. So. The in, these insights, though, are going to be more pronounced, or sorry, these results are going to be more pronounced if prices are hidden. You're going to have larger markups. You're going to have even more kind of high markups at the top. And so this compression is going to be more extreme. And these insights are really only possible 
because we're allowing for heterogeneity among firms in their quality and their unit costs. Okay. Now, the other part of this, though, is that particularly with hidden prices, you can get different results. And to see this, instead, we consider a model where advertised demand, demand if prices were known prior to search, is a symmetric demand function. But what we're gonna vary is the underlying composition. So you can think some firms are gonna have relatively lower search costs, but they're gonna have relatively lower values as well. And then you're gonna have firms with relatively higher values and we're gonna balance that with relatively higher search costs. Low search costs we'll call search accessibility. And the idea is that a more accessible firm is gonna have a lower quality, or sorry, yeah, a more accessible firm will have a lower quality exactly at kind of the perfect balance. Now, the reason we're doing this is to show that if you index on this composition, you're gonna get a different result. And the key part of this is that while the modal order will still be the index, the most likely order the consumer picks will be to follow going high accessibility to low accessibility. The firm that's more accessible is gonna have relatively lower markups. There's less distortion from hidden prices. And so you're gonna have that low markup firms come earlier in the search process on average and they're gonna have higher demands. So note that this is different than the net quality index. So if advantage is only on quality or cost, this is different than if you think about advantage on how accessible something is. The point here is just that thinking about search is gonna get new intuition, but a lot of the other intuition, for example, the net quality will follow as well. Now, the key is that we're gonna solve this model with both advertised and hidden prices separately. So we'll consider the scenario where the consumer knows the prices, all of the prices before search. We'll consider a scenario where the consumer only learns their relevant price for a product after paying that search cost. Firm differentiation is gonna be in this model in the term in product quality, unit costs, and search costs. So we'll allow these to vary across firms. We have a special case that we solve with correlated search costs. We do this with N firms with positive correlation and with the duopoly with negative correlation. This is in the paper, but not in the presentation. Then one of the things that we don't do today, but we can do is add kind of this personalized quality. Thinking of the value that a consumer has, has two heterogeneous components. One's observed prior to search, one's observed after paying your search cost. We don't have that in the paper today or in the model today, but our results are robust to it, even though they do not require it. Okay. Now, one of the things though, is that the model itself, which once again, I'll outline in a few minutes, is gonna be fairly robust in the sense that it can match in terms of advertised demands, any discrete choice demand system. So any model that you could come up with that's a discrete choice model can be matched with one of our search models. You have to pick kind of the right set of search models to match it, but one such set always exists. On the other hand, you could think about building from common match value distributions up to a search model. And while we're gonna parameterize our search cost distribution, we're not gonna make strong assumptions on the match values. We will once we get to pricing, but these will also be fairly similar to past assumptions other papers have made. And the last thing, and this really just comes out of heterogeneous search costs or heterogeneous pre-values like in Choi, which is once you have this variation in the scores, which we'll see in a few slides, which determine the search order, any combination of search order, number of searches, and final selection from the set of searched items can occur with a positive probability. So this is just the idea that nothing is gonna be falsified. For example, if a consumer makes a comeback to a prior option, that has a positive probability in this model. Okay, so I'm gonna do that thing where I put up a bunch of papers all at once. Um, now, the three papers to focus on are the ones that use the MINRI formulation. So we will be using a similar thing for those of you who know it. We will go over it in a few slides. I won't prove it, I'll take it as given, but it's this idea that these old results from Weitzman where he scores objects and you have values for the objects that are inside of a box, Armstrong shows that you can take the minimum of the score and the value and that will basically define your selections. The highest minimum score and value together will define the selection. Now, Choi's paper and Jose Luis's paper both then build some extra heterogeneity into the model. The first of those two does that pre-value heterogeneity that I already mentioned. The other one does search cost heterogeneity. 
in terms of what we use to actually solve the pricing game, we're the closest to the Choi paper. But in terms of the methodology we use, we're actually the co closest to the car search paper by Jose Luis and others who I bet are all in the audience. Okay. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is that what we do here is going to rely on the discrete choice literature quite a bit. We're going to use Quint to get our results or to really build on Quint. But the other part is that we're going to show that we can match any discrete choice model. And so we're relevant to that literature because we're going to show that they're all robust to ordered search. You can come up with ordered search models that will be equivalent. Good. So now we're going to get into the model. Um, the key is I'm going to set this up. So Dan, can, can I ask you, um, compared to the first three papers that, um, that you mentioned, so what is the main kind of contribution that you have? Uh, so, so because this kind of going back between search and, and discrete choice models is also at the core, core of these three papers. So, so, so what is the, the main new feature that you will have compared to them? So one, we're actually going to solve a hidden price game with existence and uniqueness of a pricing equilibrium. So on the pricing results will be different, right? So the Choi et al. paper is about advertised prices. Mm -hmm. Jose Luis's paper is about empirical estimation. And then Armstrong's is a more general paper, but generally doesn't go and solve, for example, firm heterogeneity with hidden prices um, and get a unique equilibrium. Now, the other part is that those go only one direction. They show that if you, have a dis if you have an ordered search model, you can always rewrite it as a discrete choice model. They do not, however, provide you a methodology for writing down a discrete or a search model that has type one demands if prices are advertised. So we're going to go the other direction. Basically, they show that any search model can be reformulated as a discrete choice model. If you want to think about that, that's basically one direction, kind of a subset relationship. What we say is hand us any discrete choice model. I can write down an entire set of ordered search models that are going to have the same demand if prices are advertised, same payoffs for consumers if prices are advertised. And that means that I can basically show that every one of the discrete choice results is robust to search. Right. The other way says if you find the right model, then it will share the properties. We're giving a method for finding kind of the right search models to match discrete choice models. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, keep asking, by the way. Uh, I, I appreciate all these questions. So the setup's gonna be fairly standard. The notation's gonna be slightly different than in some of the past papers, and I'll flag where these differences occur. So the idea is there's gonna be consumers, I equals one up, or sorry, there's gonna be options that the consumer selects among, I equals one up to N. Each option is going to have an associated search cost and conditional utility. Search costs are going to be heterogeneous. Conditional utilities are going to be quality minus price plus this epsilon, and that's also going to be your match value, and that, that'll be also heterogeneous. Note we're keeping the quality outside just because it will make things easier as we move forward. Now, we're going to keep this set up. The key idea is now we're going to make epsilon. And so, 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 sorry. Dave, may I ask a question? So is, is search cost specific to, to a firm in this case? So it will be drawn and think we've got one consumer who has a realized search cost, but the firms are only going to know the associated search cost distribution that they have. So there will be a distribution of search costs. So ex ante, the consumer, first thing they're going to do is observe their search costs. So from the perspective of the consumer, they will know their search cost. From the perspective mm -hmm. of the firms, it will be similar to a match value in that they will know that there is a distribution over which these are pulled, but they will not know the consumer's search cost when they price. So, so that, that I understand. But for a single consumer, uh, the realization of the search cost is the same for every single firm, for example, no. any firm. Nope. They are independent across all options. Across all options. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Now, they can vary in their distribution, so they don't need to be IID. You can have low search cost distributions for some options, high search cost distributions for the other in a first order stochastic sense, but they're not constant here. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. And this is going to be important. In some sense, you've got match value heterogeneity, and you need to balance it with some sort of independent um, shock to the scores. And this is what search cost will do here. Okay, so we'll get into that in a bit, though. Uh, so 
The key idea is what's common knowledge once we get to pricing is going to be the QI for each firm, the search cost distribution, and the epsilon distribution for each of these items. Okay. Now, initially, the consumer is going to observe all their search costs. So from the perspective of the consumer, they know what they pay to look at each option. And there's also going to be an outside option, which is just going to be suppressed inside of the notation moving forward. Prior to searching I, the consumer can have an incorrect belief. So they could believe that the price of I is PI hat. When we get to advertised pricing, we're going to assume that there is no incorrect beliefs. For hidden, this gives us what deviation demands are going to look like. To simplify notation, instead of writing QI minus PI, we're going to write XI. And instead of writing QI minus the anticipated price PI hat, we're just going to write XI hat. Now, search is going to be sequential where at each stage of the search process, the consumer can search a new option among the set of options they have not yet searched and observe the price and the epsilon, or the consumer can select among the set of previously searched options with costless recall. The consumer's path is the value of her selection minus all incurred search costs. So with the exception of heterogeneous search costs, this is a fairly standard ordered search model with costless recall. And heterogeneous search costs don't change kind of the underlying math of how you'd solve for Weitzman scores because they're known to the consumer. Okay, but we'll get there in a second. Now, the key is that it's useful to define an expected improvement function. So this is, if you had a value Z and you look at the epsilon distribution above it, this is integrating over all the improvements you could have. And if you solve for a score, note that this is kind of the myopic score where if this was the only thing you had, and you had an outside option, this is what's going to define whether you open the box, whether your value is above or below V bar I. Now, you can take this expected improvement function. It will be a bijection over the set that we're working over. And you just get that the score is going to be this, this anticipated XI, this anticipated mean, plus this gamma inverse of SI. And we'll, we'll call this an accessibility score. Sometimes it's a reserve price, though technically the QI is outside right now. And RI is going to be what we use moving forward. So we're just going to suppress search costs inside of this value. Now, the effective value, as we'll call it, is going to be the minimum of the value and the score. With correct anticipation, this XI will pull out and we'll only have the epsilon plus RI that we have to, or the min of the epsilon and the RI, and we'll define that to be omega. So with correct anticipation, omega is basically the heterogeneity in the effective value coming jointly from match values and this accessibility score. Okay. Now I'm going to rely heavily on past papers that I highly recommend reading, but because we're only going to have a limited time, I'm not going to go into them today. The first thing is Weitzman scores will show the optimal search process. So if you score everything, you search through order, uh, search through products in decreasing order of your scores. You stop searching if the value VI, if you've observed a value VI above all remaining scores. And because there is costless recall, when you stop, you just select the highest option that you have. Now from Armstrong or Choi, depending on who we give credit to, the demand for product I is going to be the probability that the effective value for I is higher than all other effective values. And if you have correct anticipation, the payoff on average from this entire process when the consumer is behaving optimally is actually going to be the max, the expectation of the maximum effective value. So effective values will describe both selections and payoffs. Now, this is really useful. The other part of this is just to remind you, this will get us the demand function we have here. We won't put it up very often, but this is just integrating over uh, the different effective values. Now, we'll simplify this in a little bit. This is just to show that this demand is going to be determined by both the anticipated means and the actual means, these XIs and these XI hats. Okay. Now we're going to introduce the part that starts kind of what we do individually in our paper, and this is going to be the conjugate search cost assumption. So what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize the search cost distribution based on the match value distribution. So F epsilon I is determined by the match value distribution since it's that CDF. Gamma epsilon I inverse is also defined by that since it's the expected improvement function inverted. Now, it may at first seem a little odd that we're doing it this way, but when you instead of thinking about search costs and you map this through into scores, 
you're going to see that what this is doing is it's making the score of the, the sorry, the RIs and the epsilon i's have the same survival function just raised to a different power. So it'll be one on the epsilon distribution because that's what we're building on top of, and it'll be bi. And bi is going to be the search cost parameter. Higher bi's correspond to first order stochastic changes to the search cost distribution. Now, just to simplify notation moving forward, uh, survival functions are going to be one minus f, so one minus the CDF, um, and that will denote that as g. Any level of search cost can be obtained by adjusting bi. So this won't restrict the average search cost, but it will parameterize the distribution. Now, so our argument is that- I know that this, this seems somewhat, I mean, restrictive in the sense that it seems that depending on the match value distribution, you restrict the distribution of search cost quite a bit. I understand that with the parameter B, you still have some some scope to maneuver, but but um, you cannot allow for more general search cost distributions. No, um, now now I I think we could as a next step, but the first step here is to sell, for example, a hidden price game and get existence and uniqueness. I think after this point we can become more robust with how we do this, um, and and I actually have a few ideas on how to expand it, but we won't talk about that today. Um, but yeah. The idea is that we basically, when we write down these search models, we've got two different distributions. And instead of worrying about the distribution of the search cost and the distribution of the match values, we're gonna describe the search cost distribution using a single parameter, which will definitely lose some generality on the search cost side. It won't restrict the demands we can get out. We can get for, it will restrict uh, incorrect anticipation demands, but it won't restrict uh, advertised demands. So, you were to write down an advertised search model, we can match any demand function you can get out of that. Um, but it will be restrictive on this kind of parameter space. Yeah. We'll argue that the gains are worth it, but yes, this is an important thing. We are parameterizing the search cost distribution. Okay. But what it gets us is gonna be the following, that the survival function of R epsilon i, r i, and omega i, remember omega i is this heterogeneity and the effective value with correct anticipation, they're actually all gonna have the same survival function just raised to a different power. So it will link up a bunch of these. Now what that then gets you is that if you think about the effective value survival uh, function, now this is with incorrect anticipation. When you, when you do this, you have the min of two random variables and the min of two random variables that are independent, you just, get a survival function that's the two component survival functions multiplied together. And so you'll get the survival function for the epsilons and the ris, but with the xi and the xi hat, correct and incorrect anticipation. And then you can write it out using the fact that we've now parameterized this ri distribution. Now, what's a little bit subtle here, but is very important, is that there's gonna actually be an underlying geometric mean. So for those of you who saw this back when it was kind of more rudimentary in my job market paper, I called this the geometric search model. And the reasoning is because there's this geometric mean underlying everything. Now what it is, is it's gonna be the geometric mean of the survival function with advertised prices with correct anticipation. And then it's also gonna be the mean with respect to the anticipated survival function. So that'd be adjusting what's inside the box to match anticipation with relative weights one over one plus bi and bi over one plus bi. And we're gonna see the red part again and again and again, because this is the relative weight on the part that's determined by the actual price, not the anticipated price when we move on to hidden. So this will be helpful as we move forward. Okay. So the advertised demand for i is gonna be the following. Note that this is just using the fact that we know that with correct anticipation, it's just going to be xi plus omega i for is going to be vi star, the effective value. This looks a lot like a discrete choice demand, and it will be matchable to any discrete choice demand. Now, however, if there's a deviation for a single firm, we can do this for every other firm, but the firm that's deviating from an equilibrium once we get to hidden prices would have incorrect anticipation because they're deviating. And so one of the key things though, is that the GSM or the CSM is gonna link up these two. So if you take the derivative of demand with respect to XI 
and then evaluate this at correct anticipation, this is going to equal 1 over 1 plus bi times the derivative of the advertised demand with respect to xi. So this is either imposing correct anticipation before taking the derivative or after, and they're only going to be off by the relative weight 1 over 1 plus bi. And this is going to be how we're going to solve hidden prices later, because small deviations from correct anticipation are going to be well behaved. Okay. Now, um, the next part of this, and I need to speed up a bit, um, the, we're going to introduce some assumptions. And these assumptions are going to be uh, one pretty standard, and then the second one, I'll explain where it comes from. So the first assumption is that all the densities are log concave, so match values and the outside option are going to have log concave densities with a support that's not bounded above. This is a slightly stronger version of quint because quint only assumes that the CDF and the survival function is log concave. Now what this is going to get us though is that the effective values, the, uh, this omega i distribution is also going to have a log concave density and so we'll be able to apply quint with advertised demand to get that demand, lo the log of demand is concave in price and super modular in PI and PJ. And we're always going to impose a one when we do prices. On the other hand, assumption two is basically going to be a regularity condition to get us that the density of these RIs is log concave. And as you can see, basically, once you assume a one, everything's going to be log concave in that density except for the two red parts. And these are just mathematical manipulations. So if bi was less than one, you get a negative power. And so that's log convex. But if bi is greater than or equal to one, search costs are sufficiently large, then you get log concavity of these ris. On the other hand, if you make the hazard rate log concave, then it won't matter what the power is. And that works for things like type one and reverse type one, which we'll see in a little. Now, A1 and A2 together are going to get us that deviation demands are going to be log concave in prices, and that's what we're going to use. Conditional values, scores, and advertised effective values are all going to have log concave densities. And then other nice other parts of the search process are also going to be nice. For example, the probability that you search I is also going to be log concave in the mean parameters. So this is getting a lot of kind of nice regularity conditions across the model. Okay. Now, to kind of give a tangible example moving forward, let's imagine that we wanted to get our advertised demand function to be type one. And so what we do is we define the survival function of the epsilons to be the survival function of a type one distribution raised to the one over one plus bi power. When you then take this through and you get to the omegas, you're gonna find that you've got these two powers canceling and you just get type one extreme value as the CDF of the omega. Since omegas define the demand function, if prices are advertised, we just get the demands are type one. Now what's useful here is that this is gonna hold for any vector of Bs where at this point, instead of fixing the match value distribution and stacking search costs on top of it, Bs are now changing both in a way that preserves the composition. And so these will be those composition effects that we'll talk about later. Now this works though for any discrete choice model. So that was one CDF, but you can plug in any other CDF you want. So now we're just gonna superscript everything with DC. Think of this as the same model as earlier, but you set all search costs to zero. And what we're gonna get then is that we can match any discrete choice model using the exact same process. There's no restriction on kind of the composition vector you use. And this will get you a continuum of demand equivalent CSMs with advertised prices. With hidden prices, though, they will not be equivalent. And the search that's going on in the background is not the same. Only this one key factor, which is the advertised demand, or one feature. And we'll talk about composition shifts later. Now, what this gets us, though, is that we can match any discrete choice demand model. So any result from any paper that uses a discrete choice system that could be represented with the model we just showed can be matched with our model. And this includes empirical work, this includes theory work, and it's just because we're coming up with exact equivalent demand functions. And so if you use these somewhere, we can match them. And the key is that this proof is constructed. Now note, this is kind of, as I said, different than what you could get with Armstrong. 
without assuming zero search costs. So if you impose zero search costs, you could always get this, but we'll get this for arbitrary levels of search costs, as long as they're positive. Okay. So now I'm gonna go into pricing. And most of the beginning of this is gonna be standard single product pricing. Single product firms picking prices, there's a unit cost, their profit is gonna be their price minus their cost times demand. We're gonna look at markups just to keep things concise today and mean values. And so we'll take QI minus CI and call it net quality. And everything we'll say today will be in terms of net quality, but you can break it back apart if you want. We focus our analysis though on markups and mean values just to keep things concise here. Now we're gonna assume that the distributions from the CSM or a discrete choice model, if that's the thing we're considering, are common knowledge. Each QI and CI are also common knowledge. In the advertised pricing game, we're gonna look for pure strategies. And in the hidden price game, we're gonna make the added assumption of correct anticipation in equilibrium. Passive beliefs are in the background here. In both games, as I said, correct anticipation is going to hold an equilibrium. So we can apply any properties that we show for correct anticipation to equilibrium outcomes. So this leads us to general pricing properties. So this is what Quint gives. There's a unique price. Uh, we can connect markups and mean effective values to that quality, so on and so forth. There are actually more results in Quint, which all apply but it's not worth putting them all up just kind of on one slide. Now with a one, if you were to set search cost to zero or just use it as a discrete choice model, Quint immediately applies because it will just match the two requirement assumptions that Quint has to apply as results. Now with advertised, you're demand equivalent to a discrete choice model. And so as we already argued, Quint will hold with a one. Now you can actually relax a one to assume that the omega i CDF and survival function is log concave for each option. We just make the stronger assumption to keep things concise as we move into hidden prices. So now with I have hidden a quick question. Mm -hmm. So can you accommodate uh, like cases in which some consumers have zero search costs sort of, sort of uh, yep. informed consumers in the hidden price case? Would the, the, the like the, work, would it work for you, the, like the equilibrium existence and stuff like that? So you could make a product that has a zero search cost. As for making it so that a mass of consumers have a zero search cost and then you move up, I suspect the answer is yes, but I'd have to think about it. Okay, so there so could be my... one option that all consumers see for free. Since our okay. model is going to be solved for any BI, that actually can admit a BI of zero that we don't talk about. Okay. Now that will work with hidden or advertised. Now it's not in the presentation today, but for those of you who are familiar with my job market paper, I actually show that this is a bit more flexible. Some firms can be advertised. Some firms can have hidden prices. That's outside the scope of this paper. So there's quite a bit you can vary here and still get existence and uniqueness. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, may, Dan, uh, hello. May I ask also one question? So in this paper by Choi, you need actually sufficient heterogeneity in the ex-ante values or several values of the of the products. Here, you don't have that. You don't have that heterogeneity. So mm -hmm. all the existence is coming through heterogeneous search cores. Yep. And then what is, can you again uh, make a link between the assumption you need on this heterogeneity of search cores and the heterogeneity in the ex-ante or server world, if there is, or can you explain a little bit more about that? What is the a assumption you really need on heterogeneous search costs. It, so heterogeneous search costs get you a very far distance. And the reason- But, not, but not, it's not sufficient. Uh, so you'd that... have to find a way of shaping things right. But just to explain, um, if you have two random variables and you make one of them a constant and the other one a random variable, you'll have a mass point. And this is the mass point problem that we all know. Mm -hmm. Now you can add a third random variable, but that min still has a mass point. You're just spreading it around. On the other hand, the second you make that other thing a random variable, there is no mass point. It just doesn't exist. So in terms of getting around the mass point problem, we argue that search costs make more sense, but you could use a different one. So for example, your paper, you use a different construction 
And that construction, as long as you're working only with advertised, actual will work with a wide range of functions. Hmm. And all of those with similar conditions will also get existence and uniqueness, as well as all of choice or as all of Quint's results. So there are actually other ways of doing this. Now, part of it is that with certain distributions, you do need BI to be greater than one or equal to one. And that is not just giving you a sufficiently high search cost, but a sufficiently spread out search cost. Because as you limit into zero, you're compressing everything down to search costs are zero. So that is a bit of a variance part here. Um, good question, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna move forward now. Now, advertised is done purely because once you know this demand equivalence, you're just directly applying. Um, but hidden takes more work and that's what we're about to do. Are there any other questions before I move on? Okay. So the way to do this is, is to think about, well, what is deviation demand? What is the deviation derivative of a firm if all other prices are correctly anticipated? And remember, we already said that with A1 and A2, the deviation demand for I is gonna be log concave in PI. Now, we didn't prove it today. I asked you to take it as given, but what that then means is that deviation profits are log concave in PI with a unique max at the critical point. So there will be an interior max. That interior max will be what we look at. And if first order conditions hold, then this is also the max. Now, when you take the log derivative with respect to, uh, of profits with respect to PI, you're gonna get when evaluated at correct anticipation, the same thing you normally get from a discrete choice model, but once again, this composition parameter one over one plus BI pops out front. And that's the distortion from prices being hidden. Now P is gonna be an equilibrium if and only if these conditions equal zero for all I. And if it fails for a single one, then that firm wants to deviate. So if we can show there's a unique price vector for which this holds, then we're done. Now, if only Quint had a leftover result we haven't used yet. And the answer is it does. Um, and so Quint is actually considering this idea that you have products that are composed of parts. And in his model, these parts basically lead to price distortion if you allow them to separately price. Now, what instead we're gonna have is we're gonna Think about this alternate game where profits are changed by raising the markup to the power one over one plus BI. We're just using this as kind of a technique for solving everything. And what Quint actually shows is that in this game with A1, you don't actually need A2 at this point. A2 is just to get those best responses to behave well. You're gonna get that there is gonna be general pricing properties which include existence, uniqueness, the demands are gonna be log concave, so the profits are gonna be log concave, which means there's a unique price vector for which they all equal zero. Now, as many of you have probably noticed at this point, if one of these is zero, the other one is zero. And so since you have a unique equilibrium in one model where all the general pricing properties hold, you have a unique equilibrium in the other model where all of the general pricing properties hold. So now we've solved the hidden price game. There is no multiplicity anywhere in here. This is because search costs have smoothed out, kind of there's no discontinuous demands, none of that. And we're gonna get all these general pricing properties, the same ones you would have gotten with Logit back in the 90s. And because prices are strategic complements, we kind of already know this, but upward pricing pressure on a single firm means all prices go up. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get more intuition than we already have. So this is just saying, okay, we've got all these nice results with hidden prices, but they're results we have already had. So let's see what else we can get out of this. So valuable intuition is gonna follow from simplifying things, making everything symmetric except for net quality. Rank firms on net quality index. And what you can see is that when you do this, you're gonna get that firms that are earlier in this index, higher net quality firms are gonna have higher markups, higher mean values, more sales, more profit. And this will hold with advertised with A1, with hidden with A1 and A2, because all of the proofs just rely on general pricing properties with that other symmetric part added. And to see that, take two firms, one with a higher net quality than the other, reduce that net quality down. Once you set them equal, uniqueness implies that they must have a symmetric markup. 
or else you could switch the two equilibrium strategies and get a new equilibrium. So uniqueness is really helpful here. The other part is that I's markup falls, J's rises, and the difference in the mean value falls. And so that means that the original firm must have had a higher value and markup. Now we're gonna say, well, what can we say about search? So this is a net quality index. It's made things nice on most dimensions. What can we say about search? And this is that idea that XIs are also describing the mean scores up to a, a little bit of difference. You know, it might not be the mean, but it's the mean plus, plus a constant. And so as you compress them, basically scores are becoming more similar in their distribution and there's more churn in the order. We're still gonna be vague here just because there's not enough time to go into all these parts. In a sufficiently covered market, this leads to more search. Once again, if firms are symmetric, there's positive markups and so less products are searched. Now this is gonna require A1 for advertised, A1 and A2 for hidden. With A1 and A2, we can compare advertised and hidden and comparing socially optimal to advertised actually will be the same comparison as advertised to hidden. More markups in these markups are even higher for higher net quality firms. Okay, so these are kind of the results that look similar to what you could have in a discrete choice model, but since we have a search model, we can get some new results. But what's nice here is we can also say, well, what would happen if, for example, intrinsic quality and search cost parameters varied? And instead of handling both of them varying at once, let's see if there's another relevant index that we can look at. So if you have variation in two things, you'll actually be able to have two indexes. Now we're only gonna think about composition. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that multinomial logit again from earlier. But you can, this can be very general. This is just the one we use. And once again, in that model, when you change the composition BI, you're only changing one over one plus BI, but not the demand function. So you're not changing the demand derivative or the log derivative. And so you're gonna have upward pricing. All equilibrium prices are increasing in a single firm's composition BI. As that one BI gets arbitrarily large, the equilibrium price of I is gonna approach infinity. All other prices are gonna to limit to the hidden price equilibrium if you remove that product, right? This is a discrete choice model at its core. And when you limit one price out, it just limits to that product not being there. Now, by adjusting the composition of all products, you can make all prices arbitrarily large. You can basically collapse the market. So what this is saying is that, if remember throughout all of this, advertised prices are constant. So the difference between hidden and advertised can be very large. And you can have markets where firms are better off or firms are worse off. And to show how much better off they can be, if there is a unique equilibrium vector that describes total, in, uh, that maximizes total industry profits, with type one, that's true then there is one unique composition vector that basically behaves like a coordination device where all firms are gonna have just the right distortion to get monopoly pricing. So profits could be higher with hidden prices or lower depending on how big this distortion is. Now, if we index on this, which we could with the type one, we can then put high accessibility firms earlier, low accessibility firms later, now, low, low search cost firms, high accessibility firms, if you were to set all prices symmetric, like you have with advertised or socially optimal, if you set everything symmetric, these low search cost firms are gonna on average be searched earlier, which kind of makes sense. And what's gonna happen though, is so the modal order is the index up to ties and composition, but what we're gonna find that with hidden prices, the firms with these that are more accessible are gonna have lower markups because their one over one plus BI is gonna be smaller. And what we're gonna get is that the distribution of search orders is gonna be less compressed. So it's gonna go the opposite direction than what we had with net quality uh, indexing. The point here is that in a search model, your assumptions you impose, like things being symmetric up to next net quality or firms being symmetric or these things, they have a lot of bite on what you can say about what happens to search volumes, what happens to search order, all these things. And our goal is to show that in a more flexible model, it's not clear what's gonna win out. If for example, you had differences on both of these dimensions, you'll have an index and a sub index, and it's not clear which of these two indexes is gonna dominate. Okay. Now, 
as I said, there's actually a different conjugate you could use. And this should look very familiar to anyone who's looked into Jose Luis's paper. And it actually works for any log concave density of epsilons. It's gonna then get you a log concave density of effective values when you go through. And so all of our advertised results can actually extend to their, call it shift conjugate. And we call it a shift conjugate because what you get out is gonna be what you put in with a mean shift in the negative direction. Now, we don't quite yet know how to do our advertised results with their conjugate. You may be able to, or it may really, really rely on kind of our stronger assumptions, but there, at least for advertised, you can get similar results with this. And this is generalizing what they do, they do it with type one. Now there's one unifying distribution though, that can be specified with either conjugate, and that is reverse type one. And I am basically going to end on this. I think we have, or a candidate, at least for a new workhorse model, like a model that you should go to if you're trying to do search. And instead of working with type one, which is good over maxes, search inherently has mins. So instead of using type one, if you use reverse type one, you'll get that search cost BI parameters are gonna come through as mean shifts. The hazard rate of this is very obviously log concave, it's actually log linear. And so what you're gonna get is that all of our existence, all of our uniqueness results are gonna hold. Demands are gonna be closed form, search volumes are gonna be closed form, probabilities of searching consideration sets are gonna be closed form, probabilities of searching nothing are closed form, probability of being first in the search order is closed form, and probability of being last in the search order is closed form, all of which are log concave in the relevant parameters. So if you were estimating something or if you were working with something, this is a really convenient distribution. This is what we use to do our robustness checks. So for example, we consider a scenario where all firms or all consumers have the same BI, but consumers have types, high internet, low internet. And we show that all of our uh, existence, uniqueness, and indexing results hold with some extra assumptions. So if it's a covered market, for example, you can do hidden prices with this. We also do what is a somewhat similar to a hoteling line, where we do negative correlations instead with the, type, with the reverse type one. So this is how we do robustness. Um, and I'm going to conclude and then open this up for questions. So. So conclusion is just the first slide we started on. We extend key results from discrete choice pricing games to search markets. We show new insights, both about equilibrium prices and search behavior. We demonstrate the robustness of our model and our results. Though once again, we do parameterize search costs to get all of this done and the distribution of search costs. And we argue that the CSM and in particular, the REV is a methodological contribution. Okay, I'm gonna end here and open it up for questions. Maybe, um, oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we we tried uh, some of these things, but uh, we didn't go into the theory, right? So we were using it for empirical paper, no? Yep, yep. Uh, but then we did these kind of uh, simpler models, right? Where we had these heterogeneous set scores, and we found that you know the comparative studies were depending on the on the heterogeneity of the set scores. You know, what type of set score distributions for the simpler models? And now this is a much more general model, and we suspect that they, at least empirically we have seen some things going on when you change the set score distribution. So we suspect that some of the results extend, no? like for example, that prices could go down uh, when you increase such cost because you have this outside option, right? So is this something that is uh, eliminated from the assumptions that you make on the such cost distribution for existence or it still happens in your, so, so in this You're model? asking whether just a search cost parameter change could yes. lead to higher or lower prices. Exactly. So if prices are advertised, changes in the search cost distribution are basically quality changes. Right. So we normally think about quality as mean shifts, but there really could be any first order stochastic increase or decrease, whether we're thinking 
for you know, positive shifts or negative. Now, actually with REV, search costs in the uh, advertised world are just coming through as mean shifts. And so this actually, this one specific model, you know, higher search costs are just having the same effect as scarring quality and they're equivalent. Now, this is also what Choi gets. They argue it through kind of a more search lens, but at the end of the day, once you know you're reformulating, if you're doing advertised, the only thing you're doing is changing quality. Whether you're doing it on search costs or some kind of added heterogeneity you add. Now, if it's hidden though, with the REV and two firms, they go in opposite directions. So with hidden, there's two effects going on, and this is true always, that as BI goes up, there's upward pricing pressure from the composition change, but there's downward pricing pressure from the fact that you're now a lower quality. Your advertised demand is harmed, but your distortion is also increased. And with the duopoly, for example, this was in my job market paper, it's gonna go the opposite direction. So now you get that as search costs go up, prices go up. And this is because the distortion from prices being hidden is winning out. No matter what, they'll go in opposite directions. So it will be dampened. We suspect that, for example, with the REV, you can prove generally that it will go up, but we have not done that. We focus on composition in this paper. But uh, maybe I have missed something, but uh, isn't it that you have the outset option? So people here, because they have very high set scores, they may have very high set scores. I don't know if you allow for that. They may just go directly for the outside option, right? Yep, yep. And but if you shut down the outside option, you'd still get these effects. No, right. But, they, uh, but having the outside option is important because when you change the set score distribution, for example, by increasing the set scores for everybody, then more people go for the outside option. And there is a composition oh. effect in yeah, the market. Yeah. So people left, the people left in the market might be the average person, let's say, might be more or less price sensitive depending on the properties of the set score distribution. That's what we could see in, in a simpler version of the model, but we didn't go into this question for this more complicated, And but you have gone. So my question is, is this something that appears here or your assumption of the set core distribution are ruling out these possibilities? So I, I suspected something that will occur here. Um, I can tell you, for example, with the REV covered, and I actually realize I should have said this, the mean shift's trivial, exactly because there's no outside option to shift to. Oh, right, yes, um, no, no, right. And so that's actually a pretty illustrative case of like the perfect example where the shape doesn't change. I'd have to think more on this. Now, of course, no, with right. this... you're still changing the composition. Yeah, but here it's important that the outside option is, yep. is, is active, is actively consumed, let's say. Um, but not for our existence or our, or our- No, 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 no for that, no, for the other. Yeah, that's, yeah, very good question. I have written it down to think more about it. No, right, I mean, just uh, to learn more about these effects and uh, if they appear under this. And actually, so there, there are actual other disadvantages and advantages of these two conjugates that um, we go into in a second paper that I'm not presenting today where you, you actually will get different shapes on whether or not if you took, put two products inside of a box, whether or not they can be gross complements. And the geometric will allow for it, but the shift won't somewhat obviously. Because type one in, type one out means it inherits its type one properties. Right, okay. So there Thanks. are also some other deeper things going on here. Thanks. Any other questions? If you all think of anything, feel free to email any of the three of us. Okay. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate all, all the questions. Okay, Dan, thanks very much. That was marvelous. You got all that <laughs> material.